Buzz. My name is Gil Robertson. I am the president of the African American Film Critics Association, which is the largest group of Black film critics in the world. And we welcome you. You have such an interesting show, Maurice, and such an interesting concept. And so we're glad to have the opportunity today to let our viewers and followers and readers know about your uh, incredible work as a florist and also uh, about your new Quibi show, Centerpiece. I'm going to introduce uh, the members that are on the call today. Uh, we have Katya, who is celebrating a birthday, a milestone birthday in Philadelphia. Happy birthday! Thank you! We have Rhonda Rasha Penrise, my right hand, who is in Atlanta. We have the amazing Anita Bennett in my hometown of Los Angeles, even though I'm on this from Atlanta. We have the amazingly tantalizing Patrick Riley in New York. We have the lovely, the sweet Sharonda Williams, also in Atlanta, our youngin. Hi. She's our youngin today. And we have Mr. Ray Cornelius. Hi. In Atlanta. And so without further ado, we're going to start. Okay, hi. Hi, Maurice. Hello. <laughs> hey, so I want to ask two things. Like, how did you get into um, being a florist? And how did this transition from that to TV host happen? Um, that is a very broad, <laughs> long question. Um, I kind of fell into it, to be honest. I, um, my, my family is very creative. My grandmother is a florist, um, or she like made uh, like fake arrangements and stuff like that for like the church and everything. And then she like did um, church lady hats as well. That was like her specialty. Um, she never enters the church house without a hat on and they are pretty much kind of the most amazing things you've ever seen. Um, and I just was very in awe of the way <clears throat> of her presentation, of how she like puts things together, just in general. So I think um, that really informed my creative process. I always wanted to figure out a way to create, have, live a creative life, but have it to be a sustainable life. Um, I went to art school, but I ended up um, in window display. And I thought that was a way to be creative while paying my bills at the same time. Um, my parents were very into me being creative and doing whatever I wanted. However, I didn't have them to fall back on. So um, I had to figure out a way to negotiate this on my own. So I wanted to like figure out the loophole of how to be creative, but have a sustainable life. And then um, when I went to work corporately um, in window display, I basically had like my dream dream job, but it wasn't like a dream. So um, my boss was really horrible and it was really awful. And um, I made good money, but it just like didn't fulfill me. And at that moment, I realized that a job doesn't fulfill you. It's a job. Um, and even if you are following your passion and you're creative and you're doing all these different things, when money is exchanged, a lot of that purity is compromised. And so I had to like reevaluate how I looked at um, being fulfilled in life. And so I always have something that I do for myself on the side, which is um, just some creative outlet. And at the time it was flowers and I just would like do them for friends and uh, do them for coworkers. I was like the, um, what did I call myself? The office pool arrangement guy. So I was always downtown sourcing things for windows and different things that we were working on at the, for the office that I would just like pick up flowers for people and put them together. And uh, when it was like all kind of coming to a head at like me being frustrated and uh, my assistant at the time was like, you're really good at this. You should just like do it. My friend's getting married. Um, they're going to pay for it you're going to do the flowers. You just have to have business cards. So I got some business cards and <laughs> I did that wedding. 
Um, and then um, this was all happening around the economy crashing. The economy crashed in 2008. I would made it through hundreds of layoffs until like the, uh, the end of 2010. And at that point, I wasn't going to quit because I want my severance paid too, you know? So um, I took my severance dollars once they finally laid me off, which took forever. And um, I just started doing creative freelancing and all that kind of stuff with a primary focus in um, floral. And then the flowers just like uh, took off. It was a thing that like, I kept getting more jobs on and more jobs on and more jobs on and more jobs on. And so then I just like followed the money essentially. Um, and where, um, where the validation was happening. So I just, you know, took, took that stance or, or took that path. And, um, and then it just snowballed into like, you know, a, a, a business essentially um, with lots of ebbs and flows and ups and downs and all that stuff. Simultaneously, I've always been somewhat of a, um, a charismatic person. My dad is very charismatic. My dad is very funny. My dad is a minister. My dad is also a crazy narcissist. And um, I am his son, you know, like I'm his firstborn. I go to therapy a lot to um, try to uh, tamper the narcissism, but it's like there, you know, like I'm a, I'm a performer. I love entertaining. Um, that's just like another part of my personality that I've had since I've been a little kid. So um, it always, mm, my ego has always wanted to be famous, but once I started working with a lot of famous clients, um, I saw that it wasn't necessarily a life that I wanted. Um, however, I also saw how my work was validated when certain celebrities used me, like used my services. And I was like, well, that's weird. I was pretty talented before I met them. I'll be talented long after they're gone, but I see how the society is so obsessed with celebrity. So um, I was like, hmm, and then simultaneously, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, right? So simultaneously, Black people are dying at the hands of police, and I just, like, don't know how to negotiate that. Like, I think it's, like, really weird and um, problematic that we're living in a time, and this is, like, 2016, 2015, 2014 kind of time. Um, I'm doing, like, which is, I have to make that distinction because we're living in that time in 2020 all over again. Um, but I, I was servicing the 1%, which is basically all people that don't look like really any of us. And um, I, I was very challenged by this idea that like, I have to go into all these homes and I'm like the token black guy, I bring all this beauty and, I'm like the exception to all the rules. So it makes everybody's like uh, microaggressions like palatable or comfortable or whatever is going on. Meanwhile, we're just out here dying. Like that isn't my reality because my parents have like kind of low key raised me in a way where I know how to code switch. I know how to like talk. I know how to interact with police. Like all these different things where I just like make myself small when I'm in situations like that. Um, but at the same token, like, if I'm walking down the street wearing a hoodie and somebody is uncomfortable, they're going to shoot me too, you know? Like, and, and, and so that notion just, like, really sent me on this, like, um, this, this idea of how do I process this information? I'm also a gay man, so, like, I'm also often like the very people that have always um, made me very uncomfortable with who I am have been like black men specifically. Um, and that like, that, like that's like the, the environment where I felt the most uncomfortable. And so I would also be scared too. Um, but like, if you put us next to each other, we're both gonna die. So like the nuance in this conversation became super complicated to me in a way that like 
I didn't know how to process this information. I don't know how to talk about these things in mixed company and, 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 and so um, often the way that I process information is through my creative process. And so as I thought more about this, I hadn't made artwork since art school, but I felt like the reason why we die at our, um, the target of a lot of these um, issues is because we um, are often painted as having to be hyper-masculine. All right, nails, Sharonda, wow, my goodness. Sorry, I got, <laughs> I saw the lashes, but then the nails took me out. Okay, sorry, um, I'll, I'll focus. Um, but, but basically, when I saw um, the way that I process my creativity, is uh, I was looking at how the imagery of black men and what I normally see, um, it sets us up where like we're always having to be hyper masculine, we're hyper sexualized, uh, we have to have these hot bodies, we're like mandangos and all that. Like, and it's just like, and then we even reiterate those ideas thinking that that's how we have to be. When like, I don't think that like, um, you know, I'm not God's gift to the world, but, well, maybe I am. That's my middle name, Matthew, God's gift. Um, but I, 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 I think that, like, I don't really see myself, right, um, in, in, in media and how it's presented. We're always caricatures. We're always, like, essentialized in this very strange way. And so I wanted to go on this investigation of photographing other black men where we are able to just see each other right so i have the skill of flowers and then i'm also this black man and what happens when you just are present when you're just there and when you aren't putting on all your armor all your clothes all your affectations all that stuff like what does it look like when those things start to go away so it really started to send me on this investigation of like um, how do I look at myself? How do I better love myself? How do I um, love my people better? How do I see, how do we begin to see each other in a way that is more productive and moving the conversation forward? So all that to say, I then realized that, you know, the more you see yourself the, in other ways, the more um, avenues that you see that there are other possibilities to live, other possibilities to be, other things to aspire to. And um, I was given a platform, I was seeing on my Instagram that people were responding to the work that I was doing and the type of work that I was doing. So I was like, oh, let's keep forwarding this conversation. I had an opportunity to meet Peter and uh, we just like would, talk every couple of months or something like that or once a month about they're like oh I think you should do like a show and I was just like mm, not interested don't want to do a show because there's just nothing on television that is interesting to me and where I would be willing to compromise my privacy uh to to expose myself so um but we were like, I think there is a way to take all of these complicated ideas and synthesize them in a way that is um, informative, loving, entertaining, funny, um, filled with joy, filled with beauty, uh, filled with excellence, like just like kind of all jumbled and mashed into one, um, which are all the things I'm kind of interested in. Um, and yeah, I, if I could explain to you how, I think it's wild. I can't believe somebody gave me this opportunity and allowed for it to happen. It's insane. Um, but I also think, of course they would. Why wouldn't they? I mean, it's a good idea. So um, it's like both, you know? Um, I'm very proud of the work that uh, we've done and we've been able to put together. Um, it was a project that really wasn't compromised in any way, shape or form. Thank you. I enjoyed that. And I see all of that in the show. Thanks. Hi, Maurice Katia in Philadelphia. Um, two things. Is that really your mama playing the organ on the show? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, just want to make. Could you imagine if I like casted a fake mom when I have a mom? I'm not saying you would. I'm not judging, but I'm judging. <laughs> but, yes, that's my mom. Don't we kind of look alike? No. You know what? It's it's a, it's a it's a complicated thing as our parents get older to get them to do something for us. Do you know what I mean? Especially I this type of stuff where you're asking them to be in front of the camera. And they're like, baby, this is your dream. Why do I got to jump on it, right? Um, so I love the fact that you said on the ones and twos is my mom, which, and your mom just went into her thing. So that is super cute. And I'm with you. Keep the coins in the family. And number two, I like the fact that you meant, that you pointed out that a lot of your clients are not black. And do you think it's because we still have to be trained when we do things like plan our weddings or whatever it is that we plan, right? Even work around the house that we need to think about each other to do business with. Do you know what I mean? It's not that I think that think we think we can't do something, but we're so trained on th when we think the best, we don't necessarily think the best and black. Yeah, I think... Um... I'll answer that question and then I'll comment on my mom in a second. Absolutely. Um, I think this is a really complicated, nuanced um, situation because I think, um, first of all, like my business is extremely luxurious. Um, and it's one of those things that is a little bit more experiential. When I got into this industry and I got into this business, I wasn't really thinking about how luxurious it was. But when you think about it, if somebody is hiring me and they're spending between twenty and fifty thousand dollars on flowers for their wedding that they get to experience for about four hours or something like that, four to six hours, like that's insane. That actually is crazy. Um, when if you spent that money on a diamond, that's forever. Or you spent that on a house or a car, like you know, like it, it. it I like to use the analogy of, um, you know, you get more floss points out of a pair of Jordans if you wear them, you know, even if you wore them three times at $150 or 250 bucks or whatever the price point is for that particular pair, then you would a $250 arrangement coming from me that you get to experience for four days in your house. Like it, like, so I just think our value systems are different. And when it comes to like, um, like when you look at systemic racism and you look at like um, how far we've come, we haven't had the luxury to really afford ourselves experiences. We really are more interested in our survival. And so when we are looking at planning party, even when we get to an, a, a level where we can afford these things, we often think that we can either do it ourselves or we need to outsource it. And I think you're right uh, to a person that doesn't look like us. I think the even more nuanced version of that is like as a black business that hasn't had um, a ton of training in how to run a business, right? Um, my systems aren't as polished as a white business might be. So the amount of grace that I'm often afforded by my counterpart, you know, is a little different. And I think that we put higher standards on certain things than we really should, right? Um, and I think that uh, one of the conversations I've been having recently is how this idea that you go to Trader Joe's and you spend $10, $15 on an arrangement on a little hand tie and then you come to my studio and you spend $30 on that same hand tie and you're almost offended or taken aback by it. It's like, I'm not Trader Joe's. I'm not buying in volume. I'm not buying, you know, $100,000 worth of flowers that then I can resell at a lower price point. I'm buying like $3,000 worth of flowers. And that's a lot of money for me to invest to try to resell in a short amount of time. And so, you know, or we expect the most highest customer service for spending the least amount of money when it comes to small businesses. But then when we're um, going to Target, 
and they just won't even answer your phone call, you accept it because that's how it is. So big businesses get to charge more with less and then um, small businesses are expected to give you more for less. And that notion is very warped. Um, and I think that, but I think that it's deeply ingrained. I don't blame black people for not getting that or understanding that. Um, it's just unfortunate that like, I don't have the bandwidth to be able to educate or hold every person's hand along the way because I'm also in survival mode of trying to keep my doors open, trying to get my bills paid, trying to make payroll every two weeks. So it's a very complicated, uh, horrible system that ends up making the small guy look like uh, they don't know what they're doing or that they're not down or that the patrons aren't supporting black businesses. And it is just like, it's really set up for neither, neither side to look good. Um, in terms of uh, my mother, um, that was, a, it's actually a really, really beautiful thing. I didn't talk to my mom for about three years or so. Um, very recently, we started talking again, maybe like a year and a half ago at this point. Um, I came out to my mom in 2005 and um, she, her and my family, and then it was around my senior thesis in college and uh, which was all about identity and blah, blah, blah. And um, none of my family would look at my artwork. They wouldn't see the show. They came to my graduation, but it was like so dramatic. Um, and then it was just like this tumultuous, like roller coaster of trying to find acceptance, find trying to be loved. Like I'm a crazy overachiever because I am trying to make my parents proud that often like think something's wrong with me because I'm gay. Um, and that really came to a head a few years ago when I was like, I felt like I've proven myself over and over again that I'm a pretty sane person. I'm pretty thoughtful. I'm really like, I really try to do all the things to be a good person, if you will. Um, to prove to my mom, to prove to my dad that like I'm worthy of the love that and respect that I think that they should give me. And my mom, like, there was this really beautiful article that came out about me, and I was super excited about it. I was like, wow, it really like uh got me. And I asked my mom, and my mom is like um an internet troll when it comes to her children. So she like sees everything that we like post or everything that we're putting out there and so i asked her i was like oh mom did you read that article i thought it was pretty good and she's like oh i skimmed it and i was like mm -hmm, shady boots and then i asked her and she was like i was like mom do you have a do you still have a problem with me being gay and she's like if i'm completely honest i do and i was like whoa that's crazy because i've spent so much time either arguing or crying or begging or um, assimilating into like your world in any way that you want so that you could see that I am making that effort, but this is now not a two-way street. And so I said, mom, I love you so much and it is insane how much I love you, but I have to release you with love because this relationship no longer serves me. I can't lift, I can't do this all by myself. We have to do this together. And if, and I'm not interested in being tolerated, especially by my mother. I have worked way too hard and have accomplished way too much for tolerance. I wanna to be celebrated. And until you can figure that out, I literally have nothing to say. Um, and that was really hard for me, like tons of tears back and forth. But it was the first time that like, I didn't get in an argument with my mom. I just said, I love you. And I know that you love me but your love is conditional. And the way that you have decided to do that, like is not nurturing to my life anymore. And so I don't, I, I can't do it. And then three years later, like something else came up and like, she sent me an email. I blocked her from my phone, like the whole nine. I mean, when it comes to drama, sign me up. <laughs> But um, my mom sent me an email and she said, um, I'm so proud of you. 
as my black gay son. Um, and, and I was just like, mm. I just like kind of didn't pretend like I didn't really see it or something. Cause I was just like, this is really weird. Um, but it ended up being like this really beautiful thing. And we came together. My sister who also is featured in the show is a clinical social worker and a minister and she's queer. And she, um, at a certain point did like this, like intervention, like, um, pseudo therapy session with me and my siblings so it was my mom it was me and my two brothers and then my sister facilitated and so just like where we could hear each other and like talk through things and then like that happened maybe like a year before she sent me that email and it was like this beautiful thing where we could hear and see each other um for who we both were which were very similar people and um we felt like there were so many parallels in our own stories of feeling rejected and not feeling seen and blah, 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 blah. So um, it took my mom another year to get there. But like now my mom is like, I think it's uncomfortable for her, but I think she realizes that loving her children and having us in her life is way, 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 way um, more important than getting caught up on like something that like your child can't help, right? Um, and isn't a disease or isn't hindering my life. And so I never in a million years thought that there would be an opportunity for my mom to fully um, engage and fully see my creativity at work and like how I work, how I talk to people, how I process the world. And so my mom, is on set while I'm in these interviews. Like she's literally there, like she'll play and do all the things. She sets the tone for the room. Like I really wanted to ground the space and I really wanted it to feel, the idea came from um, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers always had live music playing on, um, on his show. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing because the music is always so on point on his show and it like goes with everything. So I definitely wanted that to be um, an element with, um, with this show. And so I was like, how can I do that? But how can I make it my way? How can I like whatever? And I was like, oh, my mom. My mom is always, my mom is a musician. She was the minister of music at my church. She, I grew up with a Hammond B3 organ in every single house that I've had until I moved to Los Angeles and I moved out of my house. Um, at some point, I believe we had two of them. Um, so like that, that is just like a, a part of our, it was a part of my upbringing and a part of like what makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. And so, you know, sets can be very generic or can be very like, it's all these individual random people coming together to try to make this thing. And for me, it was really important that I was creating as intimate as a space as possible because I wanted my guests to feel very comfortable. I wanted them to feel very warm. I wanted them to feel very open. I didn't want it to feel like this weird technical like interview. I wanted to feel like we're just having a conversation. And so having the music, having it like set the tone with my incense and my candles and then my mom playing was just like everything. And then to have her sit there through the, all of those interviews are, the shortest one was maybe 45 minutes and the longest one was like an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes, something like that. And so my mom is sitting there on the organ, like we're in church, um, <clears throat> just listening to everything. However crazy we talk or how intimate we talk, I'm, you don't really see on the show, but often before somebody says something very um, personal, I have given my own personal story around that same conversation. Um, and so my mom is hearing how I process this and how she process. It was just like crazy and so, be I mean, it was crazy overwhelming and um, such a beautiful process. And I'm so glad that that got to happen. Thank you. Okay, hi, this is Patrick Riley. I'm a co-host of the Happy Hour Talk Show, a gay show that we tape out of Harlem. Uh, at Melba's restaurant. And I wanted to ask you to testify here during Pride 2020, something 
for the children, but you just did that. And thank you for those beautiful, beautiful words about your mom. Your, your testimonial reads very much like my own, so I just appreciate the verbiage. Um, you, uh, I, I see that women are very important to you as they have been to me in my life and my upbringing. Um, inspirational women. I celebrate Black women in a lot of the work that I do. Um, who are some of your favorite divas? I noticed in the show you do the uh, the comparison game. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, Whitney or Mariah. I'm wondering who are some of the the icons for you? Um, you know, I it's really interesting. I wasn't allowed to listen to secular music until um, I got my own car in, when I was 17. And um, one of the first people I put on was Missy Elliott. I think she is just uh, such an innovator, like the way that she put sounds together, the way that she just like threw all the rules out and just like did it her way um, and made her own path. Um, I really do think um, my grandmother is one of the glamour, most glamorous people that I know um, in her own, like she just made it up one day. Like, it was just like, okay, like I'm gonna be the queen of this ship and like, you're gonna get into it. Um, this is my royal court. And like, I, it, it, it's just wild. Um, my mom is also, she like is more low key, but she definitely is a glamazon herself. Um, I think that like, I am a huge fan of Patti LaBelle. Um, I obviously love uh, Beyonce. Um, I like Beyonce, y you know, it was interesting. Um, I'm gonna do one of my little humble brags here, uh, but it, it wasn't until I like went to one of her concerts that I really understood her magic. Um, and because I didn't, um, I think that I understand um, this this disconnect between experience versus products because um, I'm like that. And it wasn't until uh, I was a lot older that I started to go to concerts because I was like, that's a waste of money. That's like too much money for that. Um, but I went to Beyonce's concert and I was like, whoa, this woman is a powerhouse. She's insane. Like, this is crazy. And then at some point I had the pleasure of meeting her and I met her a couple of times and she is just like the most um, normal person. And it's interesting because I think she often gets uh, misinterpreted as like not very smart, right? But I actually think she's just a very normal person. But because her talents are so extreme, and like when you see her on stage, it's so extreme that you assume that this person would be just as extreme like when they turn off. But it's like not. It's like she just like is looking you in the eye, just shooting the shit with you, just like anybody else. And it's really beautiful. That's actually been super inspiring to me because uh, to be able to hold that sort of magic and then to be able to literally hold it and know how to like turn it on and turn it off um, is really uh, amazing to see. One of my best friends told me years ago, he was like, Maurice, you're a very charismatic, you're a very um, uh, mag magnetic person. But if you don't learn how to um, control that, you're either gonna be running ragged you're gonna be somebody's puppet, um, or you're just gonna be a caricature of yourself and you probably won't end up liking yourself. So you should learn how to like control that. And that's always been in the back of my mind. And then when I met Beyonce, I was like, oh, she does that. Like I, there was this weird moment um, where we were working on something and um, she started like, she started singing for some reason. And um, in that, because she wasn't being Beyonce, she was just like, kind of like doing a little like doodle thing, you know? And I, it took everything in me to not, like I almost said it, which was like, oh my God, you have a beautiful voice. You should think about singing. 
And, and it was because, <laughs> and it was because I didn't realize who she was in the moment because she was just being herself. Like she wasn't, she wasn't turned on and she wasn't turned up. And I just think that that's like a really beautiful thing uh, where she's been able to maintain her sense of self while still being this crazy superstar, which I think a lot of people get caught up. Like you take a person like Whitney Houston, who whose voice is just unparalleled and like the most insane thing you've ever heard. And then you can just see how, unfortunately, all the people around her were kind of using her, right? Um, and that like kind of breaks my heart because it ultimately killed her um, from, and it, it, and it, and these are the things I don't think we talk about a lot, right? Which is, I think about my father a lot in, and I think about Joe Jackson. I think about um, Whitney's dad. I think about, um, what's his name? Ike Turner. Um, I think about my dad. I think about like, even like Beyonce's dad a little bit, right? These are all men that are like, their way of survival was to hustle and was to like figure it out because there was no path forward to just do it one plus one equals two. You had to figure out how to steal one of them so that you could get to the two, right? Or you had to steal the plus sign because they're not even letting you add, add it together. And so ultimately it, it's not even like, as much as they're responsible for um, the horrible things that they did to people and, and, and their family members, they're a product of their environment where there was no other way to exist but to hustle, but to exploit, but to like turn to your narcissism. And we don't really look at that a lot, right? We don't really look at like how complicated our black stories are and how when we end up with these amazing black divas, like how hard won that was and how there's just no way that you can just like be super talented, amazing and glamorous and that's it, right? Um, and anyways, that was a weird tangent, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Hey, Maurice, this is Ray from Atlanta. I host a radio show up front inside Atlanta's entertainment industry. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Ray. So I wanted to have a little, a little bit of fun. I wanted to stay in the, in the, the same theme of, of the diva. And as you can kind of see, I've got some divas on my wall. I do see that. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to put you on the spot. And I wanted you to pick at least three of these divas. And what type of floral arrangement would you put together for them based off of their personality? All right, so, so if you Anita, took... Janet, Jody Watley, Whitney, Diana, Aretha, Natalie, Sade, and Mariah. Um, all right, so Diana is pretty easy. She always, um, she she's just always so like, her hair, you know, is just like fluffy and frothy and huge. She always loves a, like a contoured gown with like a big coat of some sort. So I feel like I would build like a baby's breath extravaganza for her. And it would just be like layers and layers and sculpted. And like, it would just be like this room of like, cause it's like drama and kind of heavy and frothy, but also very, very light, which is kind of like her voice too. Her voice has that uh, sensibility of like, it's kind of light and airy, but it still has like that weight to it. Um, so that just, that was like kind of perfect, I think. I mean, you put me on the spot, but like, I feel like I nailed it. Um, so um, Natalie Cole, hers would be, um, this is like kind of personal for me. Um, funny enough, like I said, I wasn't allowed to listen to secular music, but my best friend in elementary school, Seth Hill, gave me a cassette tape of, uh, my first secular cassette tape was Natalie Cole's Pink Cadillac. So, for me, <laughs> so for me, what I would do is I definitely would have a vintage pink Cadillac and it would just be filled, overflown with like pink, beautiful ro secret garden roses. And um, it would just be like this pink, pink room extravaganza um, that I would do for her. 
Um, let's see. Did you say that's um, Sade? Yeah, Sade. Okay, so for her, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be a very, very sleek room. It, this one would be about lighting, um, but it would just be like, um, like the longest ponytail, like the longest braid ponytail of flowers that I would do. Like, um, like, would like it would be like 50 feet long and it would be hanging from the ceiling and it would just kind of like wrap and twirl and like whirl. And it would be like made out of like, um, like straw or something like that. And then I would just like weave in beautiful like orchids, like, cause I like that. Um, the rustic of the hair, the, the, the straw with like the sensual seduction of an orchid um, and phalaenopsis specifically because they're just so uh, fluid and sensual and, um, and beautiful. And I would probably add a catalayas to that too because there's like a little bit of a tropical vibe there too. Yeah. How did I do? You did wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> I will say I'm always so nervous about doing things like that because um, I don't premeditate a lot. Of, like all of the centerpieces that I do, like they just come and they come when they come. And so like I have to like ask a bunch of questions and blah, blah, blah. Like whenever I'm doing parties, like I just... Um, show up i have to see i have to meet the person i have to see the environment and i have to know what they're trying to accomplish for me to give you a, really an idea um because it just like comes through me um and i'm often surprised so i was like oh wow i didn't even i, I was a little nervous but then it always works for some reason so whew. perfect all right nails Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so I just wanted, while watching the show, first as a church kid myself who had to play the organ at church, I really appreciate the aspect. Yes, it was, it was, it was torture at times, but I did play the organ. Um, I thought it was really nice with that addition of the music from your mom, but one of the things that really stands out to me when I watch your show is it's so therapeutic. Mm. Like I, it's a calming sense to it. Um, even from the set, it just makes you feel as though that you can be vulnerable and honest. Um, and so I wanted to know, you know, do you incorporate, since you say that you, you know, you go to therapy, do you incorporate that aspect into how you do work with clients? And then also too, how long did it take you to build all of these fabulous sets with the flowers? Okay, so um, depending on the... <laughs> Depending on the installation, it was different, but we basically have like a, a day to set them up. Um, and then there's like a build within them. Sometimes it's like two days, depending on how elaborate they got. Um, but it was pretty intense. But the floral aspect of it, uh, depending on what it is, sometimes we'll prep pieces days before because we kind of know where we're going. But a lot of times we have about six six hours to like um, pull it all together um, before we're presenting it to the person. So it's a pretty um, quick, intense process. And it's because you're working with a live medium um, that you have to uh, work quickly. Um, in terms of, I am a person that is constantly trying to better myself. Um, I am constantly trying to figure out how to love myself. I am constantly trying to figure out how to see myself, how to see others that look like me. Um, when I first came out, I did not date Black men. Um, I was scared of Black people um, because of how I was treated as a child. Um, basically, I was raised in predominantly white neighborhoods, and then my Black community was church. And so being gay in church was bad. So like, I always got picked on. I always kind of got like, you know, um, I was a love for all my creativity, but I could tell where that was coming from was like not okay. And like, I am kind of a justice oriented person. So I'm just like, well, you don't get to have a piece of me if you ain't gonna have all of me. Like, I just like get real like, 
about it. Uh, so there was there was that part of it, and then there was this like where in white spaces, like because I'm tokenized, I'm just like they'll take what they can get, you know. Um, and I'm so other that like I felt this false sense of um, acceptance. And then as I got older, like I just noticed, like I've I basically I've been single my whole life, essentially my whole adult life, and I've always been trying to investigate like what that's about and like why or like you know. Um, and then I think about the environments and the spaces that I'm in, and it's interesting how I was feeling like white people love to take my magic, but like don't want to be in bed with me or like that's the wrong way of saying that they don't um i just felt very fetishized ultimately um i like to use the analogy of like i want to be able to come home and take my wig off and not have somebody be like oh my god you wear a wig you know like like where there are cultural things that we have and we understand about the way that we live in the way that we do things that just makes you feel like, yeah, you're taking it off and like being who you are and that's okay. Um, and as I was getting older, I was finding that um, my white counterparts, which my jobs have all been around mostly white people, uh, my dance community was mostly white people and um, that they loved who I was, but like they didn't like it, it. It didn't go beyond. Um, it never crossed to romance, and so then and then I think about like you know black gay love. Like I heard this quote that like black a black man loving oh. another black man is a radical act because you're attempting to love the very thing that you've been taught to hate, and so it's really, really complicated <laughs> when you can barely love yourself to love somebody that looks like you. Um, but that's like, you know, something that I'm really passionate about and committed to and all that stuff. So, you know, I've been on this, all, this like really long um, journey of trying to self love and see myself and seeing and instead of like, I know that I'm such a weirdo and such an individual and I process the world in my own way, but I think that we are all a lot more alike than we are different. And that has been something that I've had to reprogram myself to do because I have always thought that I was like special or like really um, gifted or given something like, which then lets me wear the armor that I'm better than people, which allows me to be in the room, right? Um, because I think that I belong here because I'm the best dressed, because I'm really talented, because I'm really well-spoken or like whatever bullshit I tell myself. Um, and I wanted to start to peel those layers back so that I can just like be and be with other people. And I think as a person that is an overachiever, I, I was interested in other people that were overachievers in a similar way, right? So a lot of our artists are multidisciplinary artists. And it's like, what does it take to become that person? Where did that come from? The most beautiful things often come out of really painful places. And so I wanted to create this space that was really um, nurturing and loving and honoring of our pain. I think this country is... Um, so focused on the light that it forgets that darkness has to exist for light to happen. You know, like the world is 50% in light and 50% in darkness 100% of the time, which is what creates balance. And that is something that I'm very passionate about and wanting people not to be scared of necessarily, right? Like where, um, it's easy to be dismissive. And I think like, you know, specifically in the black community, like, or people of color, but specifically with black people, like, you know, how could we not all have mental illnesses or like deal with mental illness when there's 400 years of slavery that has happened and nobody has ever reconciled that, 
you know, clearly there's going to be some issues, a few, maybe one or two, you know, and just a little bit. And like, at what point do we start to like, look at or process or acknowledge that that stuff is there and it's important to talk about and engage? I think it's important. I think our mental well, and you know, I think our eyes can be one of our weakest senses in many ways because it, it, if we can't see it, we don't think anything is wrong. And I think that my show, what I wanted to do was use your eyes, but also to like take you to experience other senses beyond that. Um, kind of like I was, I was thinking about like um, food shows, how like you can't even taste the food, but like it, you feel like it smells and tastes delicious. Like that's crazy that that's like a phenomenon, you know? Um, and so I was trying to create a little bit of that space or that tension with like our feelings by using the beauty of flowers. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Maurice, I have a question, our final question, which is from yeah. Anita, who had to sign off. Uh, she wants to know about the impact the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic, I'm sorry, has had on your floral business. Have there been any layoffs, reduced orders, et cetera? How have you navigated through that, through the experience that we're all living through, which is COVID? Um, you know, it's so interesting. I, um, I have the show come out. Um, I'm working on another show. Um, and so um, more larger sums of money, if you will, not tons of money, but more larger sums of money were coming into my business in a way where I was like, or my person, and where I was like, yay, I finally get to like get out of debt. I finally get to like, you know, be on the offense of my business as opposed to being on the de defense of my business. Um, this is great. We're about to set it off. And then <laughs> Corona, Sister Rona started rearing her own nasty head. And um, I've just been able to survive. <laughs> It's so crazy. So uh, what I thought was going to be getting me ahead has helped me to maintain. Um, we also, both of my businesses, the coffee shop and my flower business, we both have been able, we both qualified for the PPP loan, um, which was great. Um, I had two full-time employees, basically, uh, three full-time employees and then um, four, four part-time employees. And uh, my fo all four of my part-time employees um, ended up quitting. We furloughed them, um, but they ended up getting another job somewhere else um, because they had to survive. And I, I, I will never stop someone for putting food on the the table for their family. So they were able to find something that was more sustainable. I miss them dearly. I, I really like them, um, but I completely understand why they did what they did. My core team, however, I was able to keep them on payroll through this. Um, and unfortunately, by the time PPP came through, those other employees had left already. So um, I've just been using that for other freelancers and other um, people that we've been bringing in. Um, so COVID completely shut down my business. Um, it gave me an opportunity, however, to reevaluate uh, my business and how I thought about how my business needs to be. Like we were running around with chickens with no heads and then like, you know, it all stopped. So we kind of died. Um, and it's, I've been wanting to look at things a little bit more offensively and not so reactionary. Um, which is kind of how our business is. We make everything to order um, because flowers are so perishable it, and expensive that just to have a bunch of flowers in stock for somebody to potentially buy um, was crazy. So we did everything custom, but then that became like its own crazy whatever. Um, and so we've been reevaluating now since Black Lives Matter all of a sudden again, um, our business has been insane. So 
um, which is like wild. It's like I have mixed emotions about it while I think it's amazing that people are supporting black businesses and um, channeling where they're spending their do dollars the and people reconciling with their white guilt is awesome. Um, it still is irritating to know that like, my again, my business was pretty good before, like what we offered was beautiful and amazing before everybody, like it started trending. And I'm hoping that it lasts past the trend because it's worth it. Um, but yeah, it's been crazy. Our, our sale, like we went from, servicing maybe like when we reopened COVID style, um, we were servicing maybe 40 to 80 people, maybe a hundred people a day. And now we're anywhere from 175 to 300 people a day. So it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, so yeah. You're on mute still. So mixed emotions. Very mixed emotions. Yeah. Like it's amazing, but it's also like, and it's also like all that, that super influx of, uh, of sales. It's almost like my staff needs support for the support that we're getting. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it, it's always, nothing is ever black or white. Nothing is ever just like straightforward and easy. Everything has nuance and complications to it. Uh, so it, while it's beautiful, it's still challenging. And that's not me complaining. It's more just being like, there's so much to it um, that, that we have to continue to think and strategize through. Well, now this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak with you and we certainly wish you success and thank you and take care and um, we'll see you guys soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye.